I assume that you, your question implicitly is, uh, is what are the sounds and tastes and which would remind me of my own childhood. Am I correct? Yeah, that? well. Yeah. yeah. And um, it probably, strangely enough, would be some visual scenes and some, some music, but very simple music. The music, I, uh, the, the songs that my nanny used to teach me or taught me and which remained in my mind and in my ears and I could sing them uh, uh, to this day and I never forgot them. And a prayer she taught me, which I never forgot, uh, she was very Catholic, so she taught me a prayer to the guardian angel. But the song is, I even quote that song in the memoir uh, of that woman, of that girl or young girl walking with her beloved up the streets to the castle and uh, her heart was of uh, marble. It's a Czech, uh, common Czech song, a popular Czech song. So for me it would have been that song, it would have been that prayer, it would have been, it would have been a visual or even more than visual scene of my suddenly plunging in the water of the Moldau in a, in a, in a swimming pool on the river where my mother tried to teach me to swim but I, somehow I was uh, uh, let go and for a moment I was, I remember as if I had been drowning but of course I was taken up within a second. So this is Prague for me. I mean Prague is also pastries and Prague is a Christmas tree and Prague is uh, the illuminated, uh, illuminated uh, shops uh, of what appear to be a very wealthy and, and happy city and beautiful city as it still is. So, any uh, of those senses, sense triggers of memory uh, would apply because I, I have quite a few reminiscences, much, much more than I just mentioned, uh, of a childhood which, non, which lasted to, the, to age uh, six and a half. Uh, the last great memories of Prague were, of course, the departure uh, from the railway station Wilson of Inadraji, which is the Wilson railway station, and I remember the scene very well. And, and uh, whoever came to, to with us to the railway station to France, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember from just before, Am I going to school here along the quay? I could find the building, but it was an English school. My first six months at school were uh, in, a English, in an English school, although everybody spoke Czech, I guess, but we were taught partly in English or taught English. In, order, in my case, in our case, for, to prepare for emigration. It was after Munich that I started school, after the Munich agreements, which gave back the Sudetenland to the Germans, gave it to the Germans, not back. And um, uh, before the Germans, uh, before the Germans occupied Prague. Uh, so in that period, I went to school for the first time. And uh, it was an English school. Yet we were not so many Jewish um, pupils there, we were actually a very small group because how do I know that? Each week or maybe several times a week there was a religion lesson uh, which was given to the Christian students but the Jewish students were asked to, to
to go to a small room near, near the big room. And uh, we were uh, taught by a rabbi about story, uh, Bible stories. So we were very few Jewish uh, pupils, which is astonishing because if the English school was really for people wanting to leave, the assumption would have been that uh, there would be a lot of Jews in that school, but no, there were probably not because the Jews who exited for the religion uh, lesson were actually very few. Um, uh, I remember that our director died uh, when I started school and we went all to a, to a, a cemetery which had a crematorium because he was cremated and that impressed me immensely to see the, the uh, coffin the going? coffin being uh, uh, pulled on rails into a into what and then it closed the crematorium and uh, it of course was a kind of weird uh, uh, presage in French uh, for anticipation uh, anticipation anticipation of what uh, would have happened many, a few years later. So I, I have a lot of reminiscences from my Prague life, my room uh, my, in the apartment, my room in the old house where I was born, uh, my um, ear, double ear uh, surgery. I had a mastoiditis, a double mastoiditis. And uh, I was almost, I almost died. Uh, I had a meningitis coming on top of the mastoiditis at age three. And that, I think that's where I started remembering things from age three, more or less. So what does it mean to you to be a Jew? To be a Jew? You know, I have thought of this quite often. I'm not religious. I am not a Zionist today, although I feel attached to Israel for all the human ties reasons. Uh, my children are partly living there, grandchildren, uh, friends, I have many friends. But I don't feel any political attachment uh, to Israel. I'm certainly not belonging to any out the diaspora Jewish community. I'm not part of any synagogue in the States. I don't observe Jewish holidays. Uh, what else can I tell you that I don't do? Yet I feel deeply Jewish. Actually, it is my, I would say it is my only true identity. So I think I'm, I feel so deeply Jewish because of the Shoah, because that is of the persecution and extermination, uh, and my uh, participation in, uh, in, in, in the event, of course, in the events. Uh, I am a Jew, I was turned into a Jew by the, by the events of, of World War II, uh, we, we were absolutely not Jewish at all. We had, didn't observe even the minimum, minimum that is the high holidays, and or Pesach, the Seder. So that turned me into a Jew then, at some stage of my life. It turned me into a very conscious Jew, that is what I had gone through and what I had lost, that is my family. And I never, I, 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 I compromised on many things in my life, but never either on anti-Semitism or on, uh, on anything having to do with uh, Germany, the Holocaust, the Third Reich, and so on. I'm, that's the only topic where I can get really angry uh, when I see some attempts to, to banalize. So in that sense, I'm, I'm <laughs> more Jewish than many.
because anybody who touches that topic and I get absolutely uh, deeply angry and I answer them uh, very roughly uh, and that you know my exchange with Brochat in a way came from that and let me and how could I say, maybe out of all this came also my desire to write about Jewish topics. So I'm a Jew also as a historian. I mean, I have written other things, but not centrally. My central professional life is, is in a sense, is under, is really, uh, built around Jewish history or the history of the Jews during a certain epoch. I considered many times writing a more general history of the Jews in the 20th, uh, of the European Jews in the 20th century with all the currents and so on. It's too big a topic for me at this stage in life. But uh, of course my main work is Jewish. Faith, Jewish history. So I am a Jew because of my experience and then this remained the center of my life and it became the center of my work. I am a Jew up there. I would never think of going to a, to a synagogue uh, on my own but if I am uh, asked to come along I don't mind of course nor do I mind to sit at a seder table. And of course, I forget to say <laughs> one essential thing. I speak fluently Hebrew, and uh, I taught in Hebrew for, uh, I don't know, 20 years, 25 years. And so in that sense, I'm culturally uh, a Jew in a very basic sense. I am among many, many Jews I meet. Uh, outside of Israel, one of the, those who know how to speak fluent Hebrew or uh, write and read also, I would never read if I can, if I have the choice, I, I prefer reading in English or in French, but I am well versed in Hebrew culture. You had a Catholic nanny, you suffered the strictness of the convent forced Catholicism in youth. But did that Catholic experience also generate anything positive? Uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, it would demand an analysis, a psychoanalysis. Uh, apparently not. Um, maybe many, well, it saved my life, let's put it that way. Uh, beyond that, now the experience. Not in, uh, actually it had many negative psychological effects, uh, which I traced easily back to my very, very, very strict Catholic upbringing uh, and in hiding on top of it. But uh, the positive, strangely enough, maybe on the, which is very superficial, on the aesthetic side. I mean, I still am extremely touched, let's say, on an aesthetic level by church music, by, uh, by the pomp and the celebrations of, the, uh, of uh, Catholic rituals, and also by uh, by, I mean, when I see a, a, a certain type of churches, be the Romanesque churches or cath uh, Gothic cathedrals or whatever, uh, I like it. I, I, I find it extremely moving aesthetically, but uh, that is that. And I can see many negative sides. In your autobiography, you wrote that perpetual restlessness and anxiety in perpetual motion is the essential feature of Jewish life in our time. Is that a self-portrait? Is that a projection? Is that a general 
observation of two Well, it was a self-portrait, first of all. Uh, and uh, notice uh, that I lived in, you know, I'm born here in, in Prague. Well, then out of necessity, we lived in France, I lived in France under different identities. Then I didn't stay in France, which I could, but I, uh, I moved, I emigrated to Israel in 48. Then I lived in Israel, but went back to France to study. Then I left France to go to Sweden. Then from Sweden, I traveled to the States, started to study there, worked there, came back to Israel, and, and so on. Then finally I landed, if I may say, in Switzerland for a long period of time, where I finished my studies and started teaching at the university. But then I didn't stay in Switzerland. Of course, I always moved between Israel and Switzerland. And then I finally moved to the United States and started teaching there, moving also between Tel Aviv and Los Angeles until I retired from there. So I have lived all over. And uh, you may say that this is because um, there were opportunities. No, it's, the rest, it's a kind of strange restlessness, which others have noticed and which I attribute to my early experiences of moving from place to place and hiding and moving. I need to be, to change places probably as a kind of running away from some danger. Last thing, which uh, also from your autobiography, you quote Myring saying when knowledge comes, memory comes little by little, and that knowledge and memory is the same, but then later you changed it to when memory comes. Why? What is the... Well, it, it, it has a... It, uh, I changed it, of course, with an idea. Uh, the saying by marrying I found very beautiful. I don't really today, I don't think I would reread the golem with any great uh, enthusiasm. It is really a gothic novel in its, you know, really neo-gothic, let's say. Uh, and it takes place in Prague, it's very mystical. Well, Mehring's books are that way. And um, uh, that's also, I also read it with such uh, strong feelings because my father brought, my father collected books. He was a bibliophile and he took what he could, took three, four books, five books maybe, with him to emigration. Mm -hmm. And one of them was a beautifully uh, bound and illustrated uh, golem, the novel Golem, the Golem by Mehring. And we used to look at the pictures by Steiner Prague, which was a famous uh, uh, artist. So uh, I read Mehring, took that quote, but then turned it around because for me really, well, memory and knowledge were always deeply interrelated. You asked also about the journal history and memory. It comes all from that personal experience, but in any case, I think it was more the memory of Prague which led and of, and of France during the war, which then led me to start studying it. That his memory led me to knowledge, and as my memory, in a way, who became more deeper, if you wish, with time, my plunging into the history, the knowledge of the period became uh, stronger as well. So, it, in my case, it really is memory leading me to. I didn't start studying the Shoah out of nowhere. I started it because it was my own memory suddenly opening up. It had been closed for two decades. And then it started opening up for one decade. And, um, and there the knowledge followed, if you will.